Welcome to this webinar. Before we begin the presentation, I want to provide you with a few housekeeping items. On your screen, you will see a taskbar with icons. Each icon is assigned to a particular element of today's webinar. After the webinar is over, please take our survey to tell us how we've done. Throughout the presentation, you can network with others or submit questions to the speakers in the box next to the slides. Download resources from the folder icon. Today's event is being recorded and archived and will be available within 24 hours. For on-demand questions or comments, send us an email by clicking email us. If you experience any technical issues today, please refresh your browser by hitting F5 for PC or Command R for Macs, or email webinars at bmpmedia.com for one-on-one -on -one support. And now I'm excited to turn it over to today's moderator. Good morning and welcome to this webinar, Managing Global Security Risks, Care for Traveling and Mobile Employees. This event is brought to you by Security Magazine and it is sponsored by Everbridge. I'm Diane Ritchie. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Security Magazine and thank you everyone for joining us. Today's presenter is Alan Bortranger. He is Head of Global Security, Safety, and Business Resilience at Red Hat. Alan has built his career and reputation on keeping that promise by helping organizations properly assess risk, create security strategies, and educate employees, leaders, and teams. He has 30 years of military law enforcement, investigative, security, and life safety experience in varied entities and corporations, cultures, geographies, and threat environments, aiding in the possession of an international mindset. Don't forget to submit your questions because later in the program, Alan will address as many as possible. Just a reminder that today's event is being recorded and archived on securitymagazine.com. And now I will turn it over to our presenter, Alan. Thank you, Diane. Good day and good evening for anybody who's outside of the uh, U.S. time zones, or if you're listening to this recorded session. Uh, in the interest of full disclosure, I'd like to announce that I have, in fact, uh, left Red Hat. Not quite ready to announce my next new exciting chapter, but I am absolutely amped that I'll be more focused on making real those promises of duty for care beyond just the legal tenets of duty of care, and we'll chat about that in a little bit. So let me let me get started by saying, uh, first and foremost, that I think all security practitioners um, and service providers should be thinking in terms of risk mitigation services that aid in the continued viability of the entities and the stakeholders that we serve. Um, but in addition to that, there's a there's a piece of competitive differentiation that we collectively can help decide, or and or define. I'd like you to think of it in terms of recruiting and retaining talent. So people talk a lot uh, now about the war for talent and where talent is coming from and how difficult it is to retain that talent. So my assertion is, and this is a, a quote from Camille Toom, uh, the real competitive advantage in any business is one word only, which is people. So if we're talking about that advantage being your people, then how we care for our people is critically important. So what I'd like to start with uh, is frankly, you know, how and where we work continues to transform. Uh, most think in terms of work for, from home as an additional expansion of your typical hard-walled offices. Um, and if you look at the statistics, whether they're reflected uh, here uh, above, or stats like the 2017 State of Telecommuting in the U.S. report, that reflects there's almost 4 million people uh, that work from home at least half the time. It, so it's a significant number of folks that don't work uh, in a hard-walled office, but it's beyond just 
working from home. It also is remote work or telecommuting or co-working space. All of those are just the beginning. And for those that I assert are in uh, you know, either emerging technologies or IT and software, and one could even say that we're all in the IT or software companies, those digital nomads, those freelancers are continuing to build and expand uh, in, in the total population of most employee, employers. Uh, I'll throw in the mix, just as a kind of a side note or an interesting uh, factoid, is that there is a firm called the Goodway Group. It's a digital advertising uh, firm, um, and their work culture is getting massively high marks, uh, whether it's Fortune's Great Places to Work initiative or the Society for Human Resources Management or even Glassdoor. All of their associates are remote, uh, and there are dozens, ironically, even that function uh, from RVs. So that's that, those are all significant, uh, I guess, data points as it relates to how we work and where we work. But why would this be a concern from a, a security practitioner's perspective? Well, this isn't all-encompassing, but I'd like to highlight four primary uh, problems, I guess, or gaps that we collectively need to be thinking about. First and foremost is the assertion that associates are more at risk when they're mobile. You can argue that you know when they're in those the four walls of your facility, you know what the countermeasures are, card access or duress buttons or the training level of security personnel, et cetera. But, but frankly, at least at this point, uh, the umbrella for the safety and security programs has to be wide enough to co cover these mobile workers wherever they are on the job. The second one is, um, you know, particularly with all the breaches that have happened, information breaches and loss of PII, personally identifiable information, um, we're having an, an increasingly difficult time in finding other contact pathways for associates to be reached in the event of an emergency. Um, in many cases, it's an opt-in rather than an automatic enrollment of your personal contact information, cell phones, emails, home phones, et cetera. And certainly the trend we're seeing in a lot of places, uh, particularly in the EU, uh, for those of you who are involved in the general uh, data protection regulations, the GDPR that's being has just recently rolled out in, in the EU, the, the actual entities uh, have to adjust to what the governments uh, are now requiring of us from a regulatory perspective, which leads me to item three, which is there are an increasingly number of uh, an increasing number of str uh, very stringent and ar arguably even draconian codes and uh, regulations and standards in which we have to comply collectively. And then the last one is uh, th there is a sliding scale depending on the authority having jurisdiction, depending on your company's posture or culture, uh, depending on just individual uh, leadership preferences as to what that duty of care interpretation is. How you handle that problem is complex and, and is difficult. So with that said, I'd like to ask a, a quick question. From your perspective, what is the greatest challenge to protecting those traveling or mobile associates? And sure, there's a lot more than, than what I'm reflecting here, but we ultimately have an obligation to act in a prudent and cautious manner to avoid the risk of reasonably uh, foreseeable injury to our associates. So with that said, how do we go about figuring out what that looks like um, and what those challenges are and what, what are we missing and are there other things that are, again, much more uh, even further beyond what I'm reflecting here. So from, from my perspective, uh, there is a lot to be said about how we go about tracking and educating, but there are maybe other things and that's frankly why I'd love to open up the dialogue as, as this goes on because there is a, a a sliding scale, a continuum, if you will, as to how travel risks and mobile employee risks um, are being addressed. There is a, a new normal for business, and how we go about doing that uh, is critically important. Looks like we have a fair amount of 
data coming in here. Let me click to what we've seen thus far. Looks pretty evenly uh, spread between educating and tracking, and I absolutely agree with that those are probably two of the, gr the greatest challenges. Uh, there's no doubt that without the education and engagement with the associates that uh, you're not going to be able to protect them wherever they are in the world. They have to be a party to this, and certainly uh, the tracking of their location uh, again, back to uh, GDPR and the resistance in general of the societal drives of not wanting Big Brother to watch after you all the time. How do we balance those things? And that hopefully this dialogue in the next few minutes will help with that. So just throwing out here that kind of what, I, what we asserted were our learning objectives for today. Um, I, I think generally speaking, we want to talk in terms of what those challenges are, how we locate and protect our employees or associates, maybe some strategies and technologies that I, we've had some success uh, in, or I've had some success uh, with my teams in previous organizations. Uh, again, uh, it's my perspective. Uh, obviously, again, there's a lot of debate and a lack of consensus on where the role of security starts and stops as it relates to uh, our associates globally. Uh, and I believe I'm presenting one man's opinion after 30 years in the in the business. But I want your opinion as we, you know, continue this dialogue at the at the latter part of the of uh, this conversation uh, during the Q and A. Push. Uh, say, hey, look, this is, a, this is a challenge that we're seeing, or this is an approach uh, that maybe uh, is a, an even better solution. I'd love to hear some of those proven practices out there. So let's talk a little bit about what I'm seeing as, uh, from, co again, conversations with colleagues and strategic partners and uh, just those in, that are stakeholders in, in uh, this uh, arena as it relates to uh, three major trends. The first risk trend, if you will, is that the body of legislation is growing exponentially. Um, and at least from my perspective, that, that number uh, of, of expanded uh, legislation and expectation, it, it continues to challenge how we go about um, identifying what those the legislative uh, and or jurisdictional mandates are in the, the countries in which you operate. Um, one that I, I want to highlight, um, and most of you probably are well aware of this one, but 11 years ago uh, in the UK, there was an act uh, that was enacted called the Corporate Manslaughter and Homicide Act. Um, the latest figure that I saw was about 25 successful convictions as of the latter part of 2017. So there's been 25 convictions of uh, criminal convictions of corporations and in some cases the directors of those organizations as it relates to the failure to meet the duty of care requirements uh, to protect those associates. Um, and, and again, the expectation is that we collectively have to ensure uh, as best we can those those continued um, uh, expectations for uh, a concerted effort uh, to mitigate the company's risk and protect your employees and uh, ignorance of the law at least at this point is not uh, going to uh, prevail you can, you ha you have to be aware and following uh, that expectation you need to do get the best you can and, and identifying uh, the, that legal registry, if you will. So the, the risk trend is the continued growing exponential uh, duty of care legislation. And the implication is you've got to leverage everyone in order to make sure that you have those legal registries and that you're tracking those to the best of your ability. Second risk trend uh, from my perspective is uh, that you know, workplace now, as we talked about in the overview, uh, certainly is not um, just the hard-walled offices, whether that's 
uh, you know, an installation in a client site uh, uh, or a, a customer uh, visit for a, a salesperson or an audit uh, that is conducted in uh, maybe a high-risk location, all of those factors and those locations, even if it's a short-term uh, assignment, there is an expectation uh, that the employer, uh, the employer who sends any employee abroad uh, to perform, whether it's projects or work for a long period of time as an expat, uh, can no longer avoid its duty of care uh, obligations. Um, my, again, assertion would be whether that, you, we need to think in terms of whether it's an active shooter in an airport or it's work travel, uh, do we, and it's work travel, do we have a duty to warn them while they're there? Well, the uh, body of case law reflects that it does, and that workplace is synonymous with whatever location, permanent or temporary. Uh, so, again, if the risk trend is anywhere they're working on your behalf uh, is a workplace, and there is an expectation of making sure that we're uh, assessing those individuals uh, who are in that impacted area, that is that is a risk trend. That is a massive exposure for many organizations. The third risk trend uh, from my perspective is we combine the three. So mobile associates, the travel volume, and you saw the, some of the stats earlier about the increased business travel and how mobile our associates are, and frankly, the risk exposures are all rising. So I'll be very simplistic here, uh, but it's it's a defensible approach, um, and at least it, from my perspective. So whether you call it impact or livelihood, uh, likelihood, or you call it probability and criticality, um, you need to start profiling what those risks are. So if if I'll play this game here for just a second. So if the probability uh, scale is one to five. It's happened in the past, and more than likely it'll happen in the future that, uh, if circumstances don't change. That is a five. If it hasn't happened and it likely will not, that's a one. So that's your probability. And then from a criticality perspective, you know, it's a minor business inconvenience, a blip. Um, that's, that's a one, in that one to, scale, uh, one to five scale or it's a critical impact uh, that, you know, the continued viability of your entity uh, content could potentially go away, uh, that uh, in also includes all deaths and significant life safety, safety incidents should be at a five. So, if you, again, if you look at what that profile is for your organization and where they are, uh, I think it's, it's a pretty critically important component to make sure that you are profiling those risks and identifying where those gaps are. Um, I'll reinforce this, uh, this chart was actually from Ipsos um, Mori, uh, a research firm out of the UK that can, has conducted a couple of uh, uh, sessions or surveys uh, on behalf of International SOS, one in 2016 and a follow-up in October of 2017, uh, where 69 countries uh, were uh, or individuals from 69 countries were surveyed as it relates to business travel risk and mobile travel risk. And 63% of business traveler risk, 63% uh, uh, believe that business traveler risk had increased. Uh, if you look at this chart, and then it's uh, slightly small, but you can see terrorism, uh, civil unrest, and extreme weather events are kind of their top three, but you also see in some of the body of work, which is linked here uh, and the PDF itself, is security threats, natural disasters, and then country risk rating. So when a geopolitical situation is going on, civil unrest, um, uh, a change in uh, the interactions from a, again, from a security perspective, all of those uh, components are risk trends that we need to develop um, consistent, repeatable, scalable processes to address those increasing risks. So how do we address those? Um, my assertion is that there are a lot of models out there, whether uh, depending on your perspective or your approach uh, and your relationships. Um, I, I'm telling you that, uh, full disclosure, this is actually uh, referenced back to Everbridge's duty of care for mobile workforce. Uh, it's a fantastic guideline. 
short, easy read, uh, gives you a good framework. But there's some other models out there. Uh, International SOS certainly has things like policies, roles and responsibilities, planning, implementing, evaluating, uh, and you know, an action for improvement. Ajet has uh, some solid uh, documents as well. Control Risk Group, Security Executive Council. Find the thing that mat or the the framework that matches your approach to risk and your organization's culture so approach to risk, and uh, it, it, I think it'll it will go a long way. But if you look at these elements that generally are consistent. Uh, and ex expected across geographies, uh, again, whether it's Asia Pacific or Europe, Middle East, and, and uh, Africa, or even uh, LATAM in the Americas, generally speaking, the expectation is there should be a documented program with a risk assessment that is validated uh, by external uh, data to include things like the World Economics Forum's uh, risk assessment. It's a fantastic uh, document if you haven't had an opportunity to look at it, but they do an annual assessment of, of what the greatest risks are to uh, to business. Uh, training, obviously if you don't train against the, the documented program, then it has little to no uh, efficacy. Uh, the risk avoidance and mitigation, uh, you're trying at least at that point to respond to uh, those incidents as they're occurring in the field and then an ongoing uh, organizational support model, so that feedback loop, if you will. So those are elements in general, but what, what are some of the elements, at least from your perspective, that you've been involved with um, and or uh, adjusted as to how you protect your traveling and mobile associates? So t take a look at some of these. I mean, certainly there are a lot of other um, you know, ways in which we mitigate our company's risks and protect our, uh, our employees. Um, but what what else is out there that uh, where we could better put in place measures to control those foreseeable risks? What else um, is uh, a way in which we can care for our associates and make sure that they they know that we care uh, about their well-being? Because again, if I reflect back on the the, the intro as we began this whole conversation that people care should be our greatest value. And I'm not talking about, you know, well-being. I, I agree, well-being, uh, you know, snack and drinks and uh, an office environment and ergonomics, all of those things are important. But when you talk about security-related matters and the protection uh, at the foundational level of the life safety of, of our associates, regardless of where they are in the world, it's critically important that we, we go through this process to identify how we respond to that, those, uh, those protection measures and what measures we put in place. Looks like we've got some pretty good results here. Let me uh, take it forward. Looks pretty split, at least at this point, between uh, the technology solutions, which uh, is certainly, you know, that makes us uh, much, much more efficient if we can uh, get to those, but also the risk assessment process, how we evaluate what those risks are and how we report the, that back to our individual associates. Um, I, again, I think this is all uh, certainly validates some of my, my experience and, and or uh, uh, experience and knowledge in, in this arena. So I, I absolutely agree. It's based on the policy, but it's also based on uh, a lot of the other solution components. So l let me tell you, at least from my perspective, now that we've transitioned, you know, here are what we think the structure is. Here's the process by which um, I've had some success with my teams in rolling out what this looks like from a duty for care. So it's beyond duty of care, the legal tenants, duty for care for all of our uh, associates, regardless of where they are in the world. The, the first one is you are not going to be able to mandate from on high, uh, you know, from the corporate office, from the, the structural uh, expectation uh, of you know, the, the formal leadership component, that generally does not work. Frankly, and to quote uh, Doris Kearns Goodwin, good leadership requires you to surround yourself with people of diverse perspectives who can disagree with you. And at least in my mind, that's that first step. You've got to jointly design this process, how you go about protecting them with your associates. If they're not engaged, they're not going to be committed. The other piece is 
there are some really smart people at, that are work for your organizations, and they know what is going to be effective and what's going to work in your culture. Uh, so leverage that. They, they know the technology solutions that may be out there. They, they have other options and or approaches. Um, so that would be the first one, at least in, in my mind. Use that meritocracy. The best idea wins regardless of where it comes uh, from in the organization. Just because you hold a formal title doesn't mean you necessarily have the best idea. Second piece is, uh, from a process perspective, is um, look at what other uh, organizations are doing. So if you are in biotech, how do you compare to other biotech firms? If you're in mining, how do you compare to other mining firms in your industry? Uh, if you're in the U.S., how do you compare? If you're operating in Australia, how do you compare to other Australian-based companies? Think about, again, where are those, uh, those proven practices that, uh, that exist out there and gather that information. Make it intelligence-led security. I'm, I know that this is an overused term, but uh, fear, uncertainty, and doubt, FUD, does not work. Uh, when you're trying to make a cultural shift or uh, implement something that is as broad and sweeping uh, as uh, duty of care uh, for your traveling and mobile associates. You, you have to have the engagement uh, with, again, intelligence-led, not FUD. The, the last one is associate engagement should be location agnostic. You shouldn't care how or where they are located. Yes, core locations – um, are important because it's a concentration of your people and your assets. But frankly, care and communication and involvement of your associates should be uh, uh, irrelevant where they are. Regardless of where they are, you need to keep them uh, engaged and not have that myopic focus on you know, country-specific risk assessments. Uh, make sure that you're looking at things from a global perspective. So if that's, again, the kind of framework and that is the process by which we do it, how, how do we go about, um, you know, the, the actual operationalizing, uh, if you will? From my perspective, the first piece is location. So you know, if you, I've heard a term uh, most recently called persistent presence. So knowing where your associates are regardless and trying to get all those that data into a single uh, source of truth, if you will, uh, uh, a single location. Um, and one of the successes that we, we've had in the past with other organizations uh, that I've been involved with is pulling it from, again, a variety of locations uh, and uh, components. You know, certainly travel management uh, companies are, are critical, but make sure that you don't forget about certain components of your travelers, like the executive uh, teams, your corporate leadership team. They may use a different travel management company. How about fractional jets, like Delta private jets? Are, are you gathering the data and making sure that those key management personnel, uh, you also know what their location is and how you go about doing that? Uh, the corporate credit card, the travel and entertainment card, uh, SAP in particular has, does a really good job with uh, giving you the location and using that as a download uh, through Concur uh, back into your feed to say, well, they didn't book through the travel management company, but they used their corporate credit card, and they're in a hotel in uh, a certain location that may be impacted by a natural man-made or uh, even a technical disaster in some cases. Uh, uh, Southwest Airlines does a, a really good job with their their tracking. Uh, I know there's a lot of other airline carriers that will provide that data as you deem appropriate. Um, I will say with Everbridge, uh, my, my personal experience with the travel check-in was a absolutely phenomenal. So in a year, we went from uh, using their app uh, and de deploying that globally uh, to a year later, a 400% increase of associates just clicking on the app and doing a travel check-in. So, again, from zero to 400% in a year, it, to me, is a great uh, bi-directional communication capability. Uh, there are a lot of other capabilities in that same arena uh, through Everbridge to include things like uh, Wi-Fi uh, presence. If you uh, use Wi-Fi, tying that back in, card access, 
uh, data as well. So all of those pieces aid you in being able to identify. Certainly don't forget about your lodging component. I know Airbnb, uh, you, you may or may not uh, allow that in your individual travel policies, but I will tell you that with increasing scrutiny uh, and cost containment related to travel, you're seeing more folks take advantage of Airbnb and maybe even jointly, um, you know, renting a house uh, for uh, teams to uh, stay together rather than stay in a uh, in a hotel. And Airbnb has a fantastic global map that can show you at any point in time where your associates are if you've got a corporate account. Um, the only other thing I'll throw in the mix are, from a consideration perspective, these are things that you're going to have to evaluate whether or not they fit in your your culture and your organization is are, are things like uh, you know the 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 safe check-in from Facebook and do you have a Facebook account where you're going to validate that and are you going to pull that information in uh, WhatsApp is certainly a, uh, a a tool that um, I have seen a great deal of use and success uh, particularly in uh, Asia Pacific, but you have to take into account um, that there is some encryption associated with that. So is that something you agree? Don't do, it's kind of like you bring your own device. Do you allow folks to use WhatsApp as a communication uh, method to let you know where they are and do travel check-ins throughout? Um, certainly managed service offices or continue to be uh, an area that most organizations are looking for because of the cost of real estate. So co-location in WeWork or Regis offices uh, are components, but again, where does that stop and start? Do you have a duty of care at a Regis office? Um, the assertion could be absolutely, particularly if you throw in the mix, that you've got key management personnel or maybe even a critical function that is operating even in the short term in one of those uh, managed service offices. And the last one is, and this one is one that gets a lot of uh, uh, pushback, particularly uh, outside of the U.S. or in certain uh, portions of the, of the business, is if you're a working from home, your work address is your home address. Are you pulling that data in to determine whether or not they are in the impact, your associate is in the impacted area uh, of, again, a natural or man-made disaster. Uh, for those here in the U.S., I, I'd ask, you know, this, the Boston gas explosions uh, that happened uh, a couple of weeks ago, would you or would you not uh, identify those associates that potentially are working from home in a remote location that are in that impacted area, wildfires, other natural disasters? Think, think in those terms and make a conscious decision along with uh, your stakeholders, uh, and that includes the, both the associates but also legal and HR and, and the remaining, remaining portions of your team. The only other thing I'll say about the location component is you have to be really, really careful uh, that all these data points and data feeds becomes noise rather than signal. So you, you need to be able to call through this data and have you know a single interface like International SOS's uh, travel tracker or geofencing uh, for notification through Everbridge or their, or their virtual uh, command center, something along that line to make sure that you're using a single interface to, uh, for the, the best of your ability uh, for those uh, global security operation center operators or your OSIC, your information sharing and analysis center or fusion center analysts. They need to be able to make decisions quite quickly in being able to locate and having to go through uh, a litany of, uh, of location uh, providing uh, sources could mean the difference between life and death. So we, we, we need to shorten that response time as best we can. So now that we've located them, now how do we protect them? From, from my perspective, um, you know, we want as best we can to have that bi-directional communication, as many pathways as possible, so a hotline, if you will. But you need to think about it, particularly if you're operating outside of the, you know, the continental U.S., that sometimes, um, you know, those uh, country codes or local area codes uh, are challenges for your uh, individuals that may be located uh, in other countries. So India, as an example, may be a challenge to call 1919, that's my country code and, and 
uh, area code here in North Carolina, uh, may be a challenge. So think about local numbers that roll to a consolidated or converged single number for your global security operations teams. Um, one thing I threw in there uh, as an example is also chat. I know there's a lot of organizations that don't like the use of things like Slack, but I will tell you that that is a collaboration tool that continues to build. If you're thinking uh, that you know a, uh, a means by which you can uh, have a chat feature in your Global Security Operations Center, uh, is something you need to uh, at least consider, take into account. The second one is um, there needs to be a single source for all of those documents, the action plans, the roles. It needs to be, again, what, uh, no different than any other incident-based uh, response. It's the global, regional, local, uh, so it's tiered depending on how significant the incident is. Uh, certainly make sure you're incorporating all the different functional uh, plans. And then the response checklist. Um, I, I, uh, my assertion is that um, you know, we, you need that, those checklists as best you can. Uh, if I can give you a book recommendation, uh, if you haven't read uh, the Checklist Manifesto by Atul Gawande, uh, again, Checklist Manifesto, um, it is an absolutely fantastically written uh, book uh, about very complex uh, issues uh, in the medical field. He's a, a surgeon, uh, and being able to address uh, many of those complex matters through checklists. So my assertion is, think about those checklists as a, uh, again, a tool for success. The uh, last one is um, that consideration for the availability of your document repository. If you lose your data center, if you lose access to uh, those, uh, your uh, your plans, besides the you know, three-ring binder that you may have in your, in your uh, office, think about the availability of what you need when a crisis strikes. And should that not be a software as a service or uh, somewhere that's hosted rather than and protected rather than uh, potentially on your infrastructure that may or may not be available in the event of a critical incident? So now we've talked about the proposed framework uh, or a proposed framework, and we talked about the action play, plan steps for resources to locate and protect. Um, you know, now let's talk a little bit about, uh, so this is kind of your role and the company's role. Now let's talk a little bit about the associates. How do we get the associates in, uh, involved in this process? Uh, so I'll start off by saying uh, as part of the, my previous organization, as part of the Global uh, Information Sharing and Analysis Center and the Alerts Communication Campaign, we uh, were attempting to increase awareness for associates about how to contact the Information Sharing and Analysis Center, building a baseline for metrics, uh, you know, what the adoption uh, and use of metric, those metrics for notification, et cetera, uh, were. So with that said, um, we ended up rolling out a uh, a, a plan, an effort, uh, if you will, of, um, you know, instead of the kind of tired old weather drills and tornado drills and so forth, we rolled out a zombie apocalypse, um, you know, and we're starting kind of that associate-focused why. So why does it exist, sort of the Simon Sinek approach? Why did the, did the associate need to care about this zombie apocalypse? And from my perspective, uh, you know, it was certainly teaching them how to communicate, giving them some peace of mind why, why we're doing what we're doing, but also, frankly, give them the ability to, to interact during those, inter uh, those emergency situations, have some fun because it was, you know, a zombie apocalypse, and, and frankly, uh, enter for a drawing to win, you know, everybody likes free stuff, uh, a tablet PC or a couple of tablet PCs. Um, from my perspective, you know, again, if we talk about the – hard old weather drills or maybe even active shooter, it should be kind of an all-hazards risk approach. Uh, it's similar incident response expectation for associates regardless, whether you talk about them sheltering in place or whether you talk about evacuations. Th what you need them to do, generally speaking, follows that same kind of all-hazard risk response. You want them to report. You want them to give you the information, and you want them to respond out. So as part of this zombie apocalypse, we, we rolled out, as you can see, 
our little zombie here, the, the cutout of the right-hand side uh, that was posted in several of our offices globally. We sent out, uh, you know, laptop stickers and digital signage and email and, uh, you know, website, uh, the intranet site, uh, et cetera. But one of the pieces I talked about a little bit earlier about lo being location agnostic, we made a conscious choice to reach out to the 35% of associates who were remotees and sent them postcards to get them engaged and involved in this, uh, again, this zombie apocalypse, how, how to get engaged and involved and be able to, to respond to those kinds of incidents and have that bi-directional communication. The one was, the, the, again, the associate uh, engagement. The second one was, what do we want as a company? What were our goals? And certainly, you know, the awareness of how to interact uh, with the Fusion Center, uh, you know, the, the uh, ability for us to talk to uh, our external customers that said, hey, look, we're doing tests and we're running drills uh, as a critical supplier, and I would assert many of you are critical suppliers uh, to your customers, you need to be able to give them that level of assurance. And certainly, I believe that that went, went uh, exceptionally well uh, in in being able to to validate that this was a was in fact a a, a goal that was met. And we'll talk a little bit more in a moment about results. The, the last one is kind of that baseline for the emergency notification system adoption. So if you rolled it out and not everybody's engaged or they've not opted in to share all of their personal information, how do you make them want? What again? That, that the to get engaged and involved again. It goes back to the why, and then certainly for our team, it was let's do something fun too. Again, we we get tired of the same old drills and exercises, um, and you can see here uh, just a couple of snapshots of selfies that were taken with the uh, with the zombies, and uh, it, it, it was a. Uh, 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 certainly a, a lot of interest and, and intrigue and involved a lot of folks from uh, legal and uh, HR and internal communications and so forth. So make sure you're leveraging those partnerships as you move forward. So what were the results? Uh, from my perspective, uh, we had two primaries, again, that fulfilling the annual testing and auditing um, of what we were doing, but also enhancing associate awareness and confidence. And the three stats that I'll pull out for you as an example of it is over a week period of time, so the drill ran for a week, almost 50% of the associates were involved in some way, shape, or form uh, in this exercise. There was a 53% increase in the download of the app. So in addition to uh, just personal contact information, using the app, uh, and again, for that bi-directional communication, was a fantastic uh, opportunity. And... Uh, that in addition to that, even though not a huge, huge number, the, p the positive is that we had of the total of, uh, associate population, not only did they receive and acknowledge those alerts, but they provided those the bi-directional communication. So then they sent things back in like check-ins and uh, emails and so forth with their picture with the zombie. So again, it, we're trying to show what the total impact uh, to the zombies were. So there were a couple of exercise value adds, if you will. It's hard to be a little cliche about it, but uh, one is using the exercise as a feedback loop. We wanted to get the voice of the internal customer. What are we doing? How can we improve? What else, uh, you know, how are the alerts received? How did you like them? Do we need to make them shorter, longer, et cetera? So having that, again, voice of the internal customer is, a, is an absolute value add because you're not going to get that level of uh, engagement and involvement with that number of folks without saying, hey, look, how do we do? What else are we missing? Using, again, the exercise as that feedback loop was, uh, was an absolute win. And then the last exercise add, I guess, if you will, or uh, value add uh, associated with it is that we then begin to see the other lines of business want to use the same framework. Uh, so we were looking at it more from the perspective of life safety related matters, people related matters. Uh, but if you think about things like NIMS, uh, I'm sorry, the National Incident Management System approach or uh, NIST um, or I, the ISO standard, the 22310 with societal security emergency management requirements for response, those kind of things, those structures actually exist so let's take advantage of that and create those incident response teams for both people and property, for information, for your brand or your reputation, for your assets, 
And so all of those response teams begin to say, hey, look, look, your global security operations center can help us with monitoring these risks, assessing these risks, uh, uh, escalating these risks as necessary for uh, whatever the case may be, uh, and frankly, uh, engaging the, or mustering the right resources in order to respond to the incidents. So seeing that value uh, was certainly uh, a, a massive success. So I'll wrap up by how I started, which was the, the learning objectives. I, again, I think there's a lot to be said uh, for what our responsibility is for all associates, and I assert that uh, employers of mobile workers, uh, whether they're geographically located, they're traveling on a job, they're working alone at home, they're whatever the case may be, must take reasonable steps to minimize those associated risks. And one of the ways you can do that is getting your teams involved with the associates as a whole, uh, but frankly, um, making sure that you get uh, as many uh, partners in this uh, this challenging and complex and ever-changing uh, risk topology to get involved to help you solve for this because it's a tough one. It's a tough one to solve. So with that, um, I'm going to close it out and turn it over uh, back to Diane for uh, Q&A. Great. Thank you, Alan. Really appreciate all this very helpful um, and uh, good information here. So I just want to before we get started, remind everyone, um, please can send questions. Um, if we don't get to your question um, this morning, Alan has said that he's happy to uh, connect with you offline to, to get your questions answered. Um, so Alan, is, is there a service that will provide travel advisory reports based on current events in any area, any global uh, I, area? I, 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 Absolutely. So there are uh, a, a couple of observations. One is, and I think I mentioned this earlier, try not to be myopically focused on uh, the location that you are necessarily in. So if you're using things like diplomatic services, uh, the U.S. Secretary of State's office uh, has a fantastic service, Overseas Security Advisory Council, that provides risk assessments and ratings, but is certainly uh, focused on U.S. Uh, uh, citizens, go look at what exists out there for uh, Hong Kong has a fantastic one. Um, you know, look at Australia's, look at uh, the UK's. So look at diplomatic uh, services as one example of being able to get reports. But also there's a lot of private security intelligence firms that are out there. And I mentioned a couple of them just a few minutes ago, uh, whether it's Control Risk Group or IJET or um, uh, International SOS. Uh, Red 24 uh, that falls now, I believe, under the uh, the IJET umbrella. All of those firms exist out there, and certainly uh, I can I can give some further contact information uh, as, as deemed appropriately. But yes, yeah, I, I would definitely look at not just a single source and um, both diplomatic service, but also private. And then the last one is relationships. Uh, pick up the phone and call the regional security officer. Uh, for the U.S. Embassy in the location that your uh, traveler may be going, and they can give you some maybe real-time information uh, about what the risks are at the time. Mm -hmm. If you have an employee that you're, you're communicating the risks to a certain country or area or region of the world, and he or she is 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 not taking that information. Um, and, and using it like they're 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 like kind of pushing back you know what's what's your responsibility in terms of not allowing them to even travel that's actually a fantastic question back to the policy component that is a decision that you need to be making up front in conjunction with uh, again all the stakeholders involved so whether that again that's legal or HR uh, um, or, or the lines of business, um, they collectively need to be engaged in making this decision. So it, either way, either you say, hey, look, this is part of your job, and you need to go to a higher risk location, and we're going to put reasonable measures in place, and the associate refuses to go, what are you going to do? But then the alternative, as you just described, they, mm -hmm. you know, they say, hey, look, I'm a seasoned traveler. I'm not concerned about what the risks are that you're describing. Um, I, I think both of those decision points have to be made up front 
don't do it in the middle of the uh, of the situation. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, so you talked about you know uh, getting information from groups like OSAC and et cetera. So when you have that information, when when do you actually modify itineraries? Well, that that certainly is part of you know the decision making process as as you go about you know make, making those adjustments. Um, I would assert that m- most organizations um, make those a- adjustments based on uh, again you know geopolitical situations. Uh, I think we talked a little bit earlier about you know the uh, expectation for um, you know, uh, us to notify them in any changes that m- may have uh, occurred in the location that they're going to and how they respond mm-hmm. to that. So it's not it's not a a, a definitive. You, you must say if it reaches a risk level five uh, because there is some level of interpretation to it. Uh, but generally speaking, I would say most organizations have had a business response where they have adjusted based on again some kind of of risk uh, itinerary whether it's again natural man made technical disasters in some cases geopolitical situations um i think that it there's a, a wide variety but i would say most organizations have made that decision um based on the total data uh, not just a, again a single source mhm um How does emergency communication capabilities help a brand to attract and and retain talent? Well, I mean, again, I think it it shows care. Uh, You're saying, Mm -hmm. hey, look, regardless of where you are in the world, we're going to – we're out – we're watching for you. Uh, We're Mm -hmm. looking out for you, and we're going to reach out to you if we see something where you are in the impacted area that may have some life safety-related matter. They may not be aware. They may not be watching – uh, the news, or they're not on their, you know, on their phone, and and uh, and they they don't have that ability to be able to monitor it. And it may be two o'clock in the morning. That's the value of having a global security operations center or a or an Isaac that has uh, uh, the capability twenty four hours a day seven days a week to provide overwatch so you're providing overwatch saying i care for you look how much i care for you and this is the competitive differentiator uh, for us to to look out for you is that we're going to also notify you and we have an obligation as an organization to notify you Mm -hmm. in this case so i I think it's uh, it's a couple fold that's the the differentiator is the ability to be able to communicate but also from a notification perspective a mass notification but hopefully that it's also bi-directional where they can say, hey, look, I'm concerned about my personal safety, and I'm going to use this emergency notification platform to communicate back to you to get help, to seek help. Mm-hmm. Ellen, do you have any uh, any sources for someone to get statistics on the number of executives that um, have been affected by security or safety issues while they're traveling? Can you think of any sources along those lines? No, actually, that would say fantastic data point. Um, I'm not sure that there is a capture of that, and frankly, because in most cases, if a situation occurs, uh, the organization is going to hold it very close to the vest. Um, I, I, I don't, I don't know of anything that's out there, but I, I'll take that as an uh, as an offline, uh, and maybe uh, you and I can chat at a later point, Diane, to see if there's a, sure. a way for us to reflect that out there. Okay. Okay. Um, for those employees that are hesitant to to you know work with security um, and and share the location et cetera, do you think in your experience has it been a, a privacy issue? Because you mentioned uh, 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 absolutely GDPR yep, absolutely. and such. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yep, that no no question. The the reluctance is related to how can you give me assurance that. Uh, this information is both protected, uh, or if it's if it's lost, how are you going to help me uh, recapture it? So it's it's no different than uh, many of the data breaches that you that you hear in the retail world, and even uh, you know most recently with uh, with with Equifax. I mean, if you can't trust uh, the 
the protection of the information, it becomes uh, more of a challenge to uh, to convince them. But I think if you get to the why, back to what we were talking about a little earlier, if you get to the why of why we need this information um, and how it will help benefit, so it's kind of the, the WIFM approach, what's in it for me? So how, why do I need this and what's in it for me? If you can get those two, I guess, hurdles, uh, stage gates, through those two stage gates, generally speaking, associates understand and they agree, hey, look, and in many cases, you have the ability, uh, as an example with Everbridge, to turn on and off your presence notification. If you don't want uh, us to see mm -hmm. where you're at, turn it off. Um, and I think okay. there's, there's some value in that as well. Okay. One question came in is about uh, how important you consider it to have a trusted on the ground security service provider or a security okay. associate, someone in, in a high risk area that can help uh, an employee or employees to navigate um, where they're where they're where they're currently um, working. Uh, absolutely, Lo local knowledge and local ability is a uh, a difference maker. Um, I, I can tell you from the other side of the world uh, what I think the the risk would be in a particular country. But if you are a local and you understand uh, and have those relationships and know. I mean, you know, if, uh, just play the game. If I'm here in downtown Raleigh, I know which block to avoid versus, uh, you know, going a different direction. It's the same situation. And having someone, uh, again, that has the training, the capabilities, the knowledge, uh, the skills, abilities, and, uh, and, and uh, knowledge to be able to actually be a security practitioner and provider, uh, is, again, is a, is a massive difference maker. Okay. Just want to remind everyone uh, to still submit your questions. We only have a few more minutes, but as I noted earlier, Alan is happy to answer anything that comes in um, and, and, um, offline. So, um, what is what do you think is the big, the single and best investment, Alan, for travel and mobile associate risk mitigation? Is it well, knowledge? Is it the app? Is it? Yeah. I would say the investment in the actual time and communication up front, um, you know, that, that's probably the biggest one because you've got to make the business case to the, you know, whether it's the decision makers, but also the, the associates themselves. So investing in making sure that you have a uh, buttoned up, defensible, uh, and accurate for your culture and your environment uh, in your organization, uh, that approach uh, is probably the, the biggest investment, and, and it, it, sometimes it does take both the time investment, uh, but it also takes the investment of, you know, your internal communications team to say, hey, look, I'll, I'll need some, you know, some, some cool stuff, uh, you know, like kind of like we talked about with the, the, with the zombies. Get, give them, mm -hmm. re release the creative nature of the, that team uh, and making sure that they have those peripherals to be able to, to share with others. Um, and so I think that would be one. But if you're talking about kind of the investment component, I would say the other investment um, would be the actual ability to monitor. So seeing what what's out there and what the exposure is and then being able to uh, to notify the, your, your associates. So the, those tools and resources, uh, if you will, that give you um, the, the ability uh, to assess and to locate and to act uh, th that's that's the uh, other component. So I would say mm -hmm. again, the monitoring component uh, for monitoring, uh, analysis, uh, assessment, location, and then the action re required. We, we talked about brand uh, how duty of care uh, policy is good for a brand image, and you you talked about the success of the of the zombie application. Do you, in your experience, are employees asking now more of, of their employers? Do, and they want to make sure they're going home safe at night to, the, to their families. Are they being more proactive with their just everyday security um, and safety at work? Uh, absolutely. Um, I, because I think folks are more both educated, but also, you, at, at least at this point, um, ri risk exists everywhere. Uh, you know, you can say 10 years ago or maybe 15 years ago, um, you know, we, would we ever say that there would have been a terrorist attack in Santa Barbara, uh, California, or in you know, Boston? Uh, most folks would have said no way. Um, but you know, certainly there, 
uh, it's asymmetric risk. It doesn't matter where you are in the world. There is a risk. There are active shooters in the U.S. There is, you know, natural disasters that are occurring everywhere. So I think there is a rising expectation from associates to make sure that we're doing everything in our uh, our power as an as an organization to at least aid or enable them to be to to be secure uh, and safe and happy. Okay, great. Thank you. That's all the time we have for questions today. I'd like to thank Alan Bortranger for his presentation. I'd also like to thank our sponsor, Everbridge. If you have any additional questions or comments, please uh, click on the email us button on the console and we'll get those addressed. And then as you leave today, uh, if you wouldn't mind taking a couple of minutes to complete that survey, we take all those comments and we tweak things as necessary to make this a valuable experience for everyone. Um, and another reminder that this uh, presentation will be on securitymagazine.com as an archive for about a year. So go ahead and share it with your colleagues and your friends and, and, and revisit it again if you'd like to. Uh, thanks again, everyone, for being here and enjoy the rest of your day.